Tonight, southwest BC buried under heavy snow. A treacherous winter storm snarls traffic and knocks out power as many are urged to stay home. And there's even more on the way. Royal health revelations. The king to be treated in hospital while the Princess of Wales undergoes surgery. It's a significant spell in hospital. And the very real threat of fake online videos. If you're trying to create a 10 second hot mic of the prime minister saying something inappropriate, that'll take me two minutes to do. We break down the concerns heading into the next election. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. Parts of British Columbia are under snow tonight and staring down even more messy weather tomorrow after a winter storm dumped about 30 centimeters in some areas. The day-long storm shuttered schools, triggered power outages, and made getting just about anywhere in southwestern BC tricky. Now as the cleanup gets underway, more bad weather is looming. All of that snow delayed and canceled some flights out of Vancouver. Transit also affected as much more snow came down than anyone there usually has to deal with. Mira Baines shows us the impact. Hard consequences after hours of relentless snow. The snow, it's a, uh, really hit us hard. It's really kicked us in the balls this morning. And the, uh, so a lot of people are not prepared for this. Lewis Mark jumped into action to shovel out stuck vehicles. The Metro Vancouver area was hit with up to 30 centimeters of snow. I came down here to take a break, and the, uh, hey, I'm working harder now, and I'm up breaking. I thought you were soaking snow at City Hall. Authorities are warning people to stay off the roads due to dangerous driving conditions in some areas of BC, including in Vancouver, where drivers are not used to these conditions. The snow started falling before dawn and went on all day. Trees toppled, cutting power and sending BC hydro crews scrambling to reconnect it. At the storm's peak, about 30,000 customers were in the dark. The drought from this summer certainly made the situation worse in terms of weakened trees and vegetation across the province. For those without homes, just staying dry in the wet snow is a major challenge and it can lead to serious health conditions. You have to consider the fact that not only is our immune system lower, but their chances of experiencing frostbite uh, increase significantly the possibility that they may experience hypothermia increases significantly. The cleanup is underway, but Environment Canada warns there isn't much time before the next round of winter weather hits. So once we get through this storm, we will have a short break in the precipitation before the next system starts barreling down on the south coast. Um, it could hit Vancouver Island as early as sort of late morning or by midday on Thursday. A welcome return for some who say the cold weather isn't all bad. Hanging out with your friends and the snow, just like the texture is so cool. There's just endless things you could do like sledding, making snowmen, uh, snowball fights. It's just so fun out here. So Mira, another storm is on the way, but even before that, it sounds like tomorrow morning is going to pose a bit of a challenge. Yeah, temperatures are going to be below freezing tonight, and that's going to make a very difficult commute tomorrow morning. There's going to be icy roads, and people may not be expecting that. And also, a new storm is on the way, bringing a mix of more snow, sleet, freezing rain, and rain. All right, Mira Baines in a very different-looking Vancouver. Just to the south, it's not snow, but ice that's wreaking havoc. Parts of Oregon and Washington State are encased in it. An ice storm has coated cars, roads, sidewalks, down trees and cut power. At least three people died in Portland after a power pole fell on their vehicle. This is just the latest weather blow for that area. In another storm just days ago, at least seven others died from fallen trees and hypothermia. The king, King Charles III, will soon undergo treatment in hospital for an enlarged prostate. But that wasn't the only medical revelation from the royal family. As Briar Stewart shows us, the Princess of Wales is already in hospital tonight. 
The London Clinic is used to high-profile patients. This private hospital has treated several members of the royal family before. And it's here where the Princess of Wales underwent planned abdominal surgery on Tuesday. In a statement, Kensington Palace said the surgery was successful and it's expected she will remain in hospital for 10 to 14 days before returning home to continue her recovery. Catherine's last public appearance was at a service on Christmas Day where she appeared in good health. The palace did not give any details about the surgery or her condition, but said it was non-cancerous. It's a significant spell in the hospital. Camilla Tomini is a royal correspondent. She says the palace can be notoriously private, but it does release information if officials fear news will be leaked. The palace's impression of the situation will be it's better to be up front and say what's going on so that they don't have unnecessary speculation. On the other hand, they've never historically gone into too much detail. And that wasn't the only disclosure. A short time later, Buckingham Palace revealed that King Charles is seeking treatment for an enlarged prostate. His Majesty's condition is benign, and he will attend hospital next week for a corrective procedure. The royals rarely discuss their health, but the palace made a point to say that thousands of other men suffer from this common condition. Well, I hope it will open those conversations that men can have with each other um, and hopefully with their GP. Sometimes we hear men talk about how they find it embarrassing to talk about any prostate problems. King Charles is expected to have a short period of recovery. <laughs> but for Catherine, who consistently ranks among the most popular royals, her recovery will be much longer. The Princess of Wales isn't expected to resume public duties until after Easter. Her husband, the Prince of Wales, won't be undertaking any either while his wife is in the hospital. The couple had been expected to embark on an official tour to Italy this spring, but that has now been cancelled. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. The United States has launched new strikes tonight against Houthi targets in Yemen. For months now, the Iran-backed militants have been attacking ships in the Red Sea. And as Paul Hunter tells us, those strikes aren't the only way the U.S. is applying new pressure tonight. As if to show the world they are unfazed by the pushback against them, Houthi militants in this fresh video now marching and celebrating on board that cargo ship they hijacked in November. An assault Houthis themselves captured on video, just one of the more than two dozen attacks on ships in this vital shipping route in the Red Sea, attacks which in past days led to this. U.S. and U.K. fighter jets targeting Houthi military installations in Yemen. Afternoon, everybody. And now... From the White House, an official declaration for Houthis as specially designated global terrorists. Look, if the Houthis cease the attacks, we can certainly reconsider this designation. If they don't, as the president said, we will not hesitate to take further actions to protect our people and the free flow of international commerce. Hey, uh the designation allows for tough sanctions against the group. In this video, appearing to be rehearsing against fake U.S. and Israeli targets. But if the new designation is meant to deter the Houthis, it has served to anger them. It is an act of blackmail, said this Houthi spokesman. The U.S. has meanwhile lately seized these Iranian missile components, it says, were bound for the Houthis, who are backed by Iran. Iran, in turn, has lately struck targets in Iraq, Syria, and now Pakistan. The Houthis say their attacks are in support of Hamas in its war with Israel in Gaza. Hamas is also backed by Iran. Comments on Pakistan, sir. With tensions ratcheting throughout the region at a conference in Switzerland, Iran's foreign minister said it all comes back to Gaza. An end to the war in Gaza, he said, could ease conflicts against Israeli interests. And Paul, the back and forth just continues tonight. It does. Uh, there's word tonight of another wave of U.S. military strikes on Houthi targets, this time involving more than a dozen installations, again aimed at degrading the Houthi ability to strike at those ships, which is 
precisely what had happened earlier in the day. Another ship, this one U.S. owned, struck by what's believed to have been a Houthi attack drone. And following on Iran's strike into Pakistan, Pakistan tonight warning of retaliation. None of this bodes well for that part of the world, Adrian. All right, Paul Hunter in Washington. Now to the war itself, unfolding in Gaza, where Israeli airstrikes in the south have sent more people fleeing. And as Rafi Bujikanian shows us, this comes at the same time a group of Canadian MPs are in the region meeting with Palestinians in the occupied West Bank. At this hospital in Rafah, Gaza's most vulnerable seek help after they say they were caught in an artillery strike. All of a sudden, I heard a loud noise in the streets, she says. A building collapsed on a boy near me. He suffered burns, too. I brought him here. Also Wednesday, Israel's military confirmed it continued airstrikes in Khan Yunus, targeting Hamas strongholds, it said. The Hamas-run health ministry in Gaza says 24,000 Palestinians have been killed since the start of the war, triggered when Hamas attacked on October 7th, killing 1,200 people in Israel and taking nearly 250 people hostage. And there is new hope those hostages, along with Palestinians, could soon receive medication and other aid after a new agreement between Israel and Hamas. It is a humongous uh, need in the area. Shafkat Ali is one of five Canadian MPs now on a trip to meet with Palestinians in the occupied West Bank, paid for by Canadian Muslim Vote, a registered non-profit charity. The area has seen its own surge of violence in recent months, including from some Israeli settlers. The settlers say they have historic and biblical claims to the land. The Liberals heard from Palestinians about extremists in the movement. Once I go back to Canada, we will be having those conversations in our respective caucuses and I will be having conversations with the Foreign Affairs Minister about uh, what I have seen. The U.S. and the United Kingdom have imposed travel bans on settlers suspected of violence. Canada has condemned settlers targeting Palestinian civilians, something Global Affairs reiterated today, but reached for comment it had nothing new to announce on the front of possible Canadian sanctions. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. Zambia is in the grips of a major cholera outbreak that has killed more than 400 people, infected more than 10,000. The National Disaster Agency has been mobilized and a soccer stadium has been converted into a makeshift treatment centre. Schools across the country remain closed after the holidays. The government says it is working to provide clean water to affected communities and create a mass vaccination programme. Donald Trump is expected to testify next week at his defamation trial in New York. Today, he came face to face with E. Jean Carroll as she testified that he shattered her reputation when he denied knowing her after she accused him of sexual assault. Chris Reyes was in the courtroom. Another combative day in court for Donald Trump. This time he was face to face with E. Jean Carroll, the woman who won her case last May after she sued him for sexual abuse and defamation, even as Trump continues to claim he's never met her. In this case, a jury is deciding whether damages should be awarded for another set of defamatory comments against Carol, made by Trump in 2019 while he was president, again denying the same sexual abuse. I have no idea who this woman is. On the stand, Carol said Trump shattered her reputation as an advice columnist and journalist when he denied her story that he sexually abused her in a New York department store in the mid-90s. During her testimony, Trump repeatedly shook his head, talked to his lawyers and even smirked, prompting the judge to warn him that he could be kicked out of court for his disruptive behavior. Trump had his say anyway at a press conference at one of his New York buildings. It's a big story that the uh, witness today, the a person I never knew, I never had anything to do with. It's a totally rigged deal. This whole thing is rigged. Election interference. Despite Trump's repeated denials, in this case, the judge already ruled that his comments were defamatory. That happened in the previous trial. In that case, Carol was awarded $5 million. This time, she's seeking $10 million. Carol, how are you feeling today? 
from Carol, no comments after a full day of testimony, including a testy cross-examination by Trump's lawyer, who suggested she benefited from the publicity around her comments about Trump. Trump is not expected in court on Thursday because of his mother-in-law's funeral, but he is scheduled to testify on Monday with a verdict to follow soon after that. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. An Ontario woman is now awaiting her sentence. In an unusual case, she pleaded guilty to faking pregnancies in order to obtain unnecessary care. Thomas Daigle heard from some doulas about why that deception was so harmful. They came to court, their identities hidden by a publication ban many of them never wanted. Multiple victims now freed by a judge to tell their stories. Today is the first day that I can identify myself as a victim of Caitlin Braun. She fooled me, an experienced doula. It happened. For nearly a year, beginning in June 2022, registered social worker Caitlin Braun defrauded women across Ontario by faking pregnancies, subjecting childbirth support professionals, or doulas, to a bizarre scam described in court as manipulative and cruel. More than a dozen doulas told the judge about the trauma they still suffer, their loss of income, and the lasting impact. Every time somebody reaches out, it's like, like there's something in the back of my mind about um, what if they're lying, what if they're not being truthful, what if I go to their birth and I get triggered. I'm angry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I am beyond angry. Doulas delivered victim impact statements over Zoom and in person, recounting how Braun insisted they give her massages while she was naked, demanding the women spend hours on end counseling her. In custody since last March, Braun already pleaded guilty to 21 counts, including fraud and indecent acts. Her lawyer blaming her client's loneliness and personality disorders. I don't think anyone can answer why she did this. That's really up to her. Braun tearfully apologized in court, telling her victims, I'm a changed person. I take full accountability for my actions, and I hope that you're all able to heal. The judge will hand down Braun's sentence at a later date. Both the Crown and defense are recommending she serve two years house arrest and three years probation. The judge warned right now Braun poses a high risk to reoffend. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Brantford, Ontario. Many small businesses in this country are nearly out of time to pay for a loan that helped them through the pandemic. If you miss the forgiveness window, you're paying to the government around $69,000 over the next three years. The impact behind the numbers and... <laughs> the push to honor a drag performer who was forced out of the military. This is the time when we have to be reminded about his incredible story. And one man demonstrates exactly how cold it is in Alberta. Well, it literally took an egg out of the fridge two to three minutes to freeze. We're back in two. Rescue crews were really put to the test in Vancouver this morning. A vehicle smashed through a concrete wall on the second floor of a parkade and then crashed to the ground. The driver was still trapped inside. The vehicle pinned nose down under debris. It took several hours, but the driver was freed and taken to hospital. No word on what caused that crash. Small business owners across the country have until Thursday to repay emergency loans they took out at the height of the pandemic. The federal government has already extended the deadline, but as Anise Haidari shows us, that's unlikely to happen again. Just those two? This cafe owner was surprised. <laughs> there wasn't more red tape when paying off his debt. And it was just like, oh yeah, 40 grand, boom, boom, boom. And it was just gone. And I was like, oh, like, Okay. When COVID first hit, Adam Cook took out a SIBA loan to adapt his sit-down restaurant to retail. And then our soups too. We do lots of soups. We sold out. We did a big sale. Now that he's paid it off before the deadline, he's happy, but wishes he'd had more time. Even if we were to hold on to it for a year or two until the economy turns around and inflation cools and interest rates come down, it just would have been nice to have that. But businesses who took out these emergency loans in 2020 aren't getting another extension. We extended twice 
uh, the uh, repayment deadline for the CBA loans, uh, but uh, we are now far enough from the pandemic that we do have to wrap up uh, pandemic programs. The independent parliamentary budget officer has said another delay could cost Ottawa more than $900 million. It's also kind of unfair to the businesses that have already, you know, been proactive and have repaid their CBAs. You know, to move the goalposts now, it's sort of like, well, what, why did I do that when they move the goalposts again? It's not fair to me. More than 885,000 loans were taken out across the country, totaling $48.4 billion. Those loans have been interest-free so far, but if businesses can't pay after Thursday, the interest rate will be just 5%. And they'll also miss out on up to $20,000 of free money from the federal government. But no matter how you slice it, if you miss the forgiveness window, you're paying to the government around $69,000 over the next three years. In Calgary, Adam Cook didn't miss that window, but no debt also means less cash in the bank to buy equipment. It definitely is going to be big challenges for any restaurant and any food business. A loan extension could have cooked up a new oven for a business still recovering. Anise Seydari, CBC News, Calgary. Many homeowners may be in for a shock as mortgages come up for renewal. You're looking at more than a grand a month in payments. Can Canadians afford that? We get some tips for the potential tough times ahead and... I am not Morgan Freeman. What you see is not real. Fake videos on the internet are becoming more common. Could they disrupt an election? Is Canada ready to deal with this? But first... The call to memorialize a drag performer who defied the odds. He was a raving beauty. There was no doubt about it. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Oh, what a dish. High low and then the cut. 2019 NBA champion Pascal Siakam may be set to leave the Toronto Raptors. The two-time All-Star is reportedly part of a three-team multiplayer trade that would see him suit up for the Indiana Pacers. It's sad that we keep losing the good ones. Take him, enjoy him, but I think we got the, the best opportunity out of this. He was one of my favorite players in, on, the, on the Raptors. And like seeing him leave, just so sad and devastating. I'm with you. After eight years in Toronto, he was set to be a free agent at the end of the season. Siakam is the latest member of the historic 2019 championship team to depart. The only player still with the Raptors from that season is Chris Boucher. A Nova Scotia woman is asking Canada Post to create a stamp to honor a veteran of both the First and Second World Wars, a veteran who entertained his fellow soldiers as a wartime drag performer. Kayla Hounsell now with the push to have more Canadians know a story. Not far from the front lines of the First and Second World Wars, Ross Hamilton and his concert troupe, the Dumbbells, helped entertain their fellow soldiers. He was a raving beauty. There was no doubt about it. Then called a female impersonator, historians say Hamilton was actually a drag performer. His co-stars remembered him in 1965. He always remained a young lady. He was never a girl. He was never a married woman. He was a young lady. If it hadn't been for my father, I wouldn't have known anything about Ross. Mika Van Volpen says Hamilton was her father's kind and generous neighbor in Pugwash, Nova Scotia. She's asking Canadians to write letters to Canada Post to get him on a postage stamp. The last generation of people who knew Ross are aging. And I, I think this is, this is the time when we have to be reminded about his incredible story. Ross, you know, crafted his first costume out of beads from rosaries. Records show Hamilton enlisted as an ambulance driver. Then in 1917, he created his character Marjorie on the road to Vimy Ridge. But years later, he was kicked out of the military. After one of Ross's shows in 1942, he was outed to military authorities. Uh, and then was quietly dismissed um, for reasons other than medical, which was a common way to dismiss uh, queer soldiers at the time. Hamilton died four years before same-sex sexual activity was decriminalized in Canada. Van Volpen says he should be recognized for providing a short mental break for soldiers who faced death every day. I just think what they did in such a horrific reality 
was something that we have to remember and we have to really, really cherish that. Canada Post says the process to research and design stamps takes around two years, and in doing so, it strives to explore Canada's geography, culture, and history. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Now it's time to dig deeper into the news shaping our world. Many Canadian mortgage holders face big rate hikes this year. We're talking about 30 to 40 to 50 percent more. We're looking at how homeowners should prepare. But first, the growing threat to democracy from AI-generated deepfakes like these. How the Prime Minister stole freedom. I did some very bad things. When anyone can be made to say anything, experts say voters need to get real about spotting the lies. The warnings come in a huge year for elections, from populist democracies like the United States and India to several provincial elections in this country. Catherine Tunney breaks down how deep fakes get used. Let's play a game. I'm going to show you two videos. One is real, one is altered by AI. Can you spot the deep fake? Prime Minister Justin Trudeau recommended one of these books. Which one? The book that I got excited about reading through. It's called This Can't Be Happening in McDonald Hall. It's called How the Prime Minister Stole Freedom. Yeah, it was the last one. The Prime Minister never said that. Okay, round two. If you can see, I hope to finish this talk show one day. Will the fake Morgan Freeman please stand up? I am not Morgan Freeman. And what you see is not real. How about these videos of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis? Did the presidential hopeful say this? I'm the only one that could possibly compete with Donald Trump. Or this. I took some very bad advice. I did some very bad things. The last one is fake. Made to make you think that DeSantis was dropping out of the race. Look at the mouth. Out of sync to the voice. I never should have challenged President Trump. One giveaway to a deep fake. For now, from Hollywood to Washington to Ottawa, deepfakes are confusing reality. With AI, fraudsters can take three-second recording of your voice. I've watched one of me on a couple times. I said, when the hell did I say that? <laughs> Spend enough time scrolling, like me, you start questioning everything on your screen. How do I know that you're not a deep fake? Ah, that's the right <laughs> question, isn't it? Hani Farid specializes in digital forensics out of the University of California, Berkeley. If you're trying to create a 10 second hot mic of the prime minister saying something inappropriate, that'll take me two minutes to do. Um, and very little money and very little effort and very little skill. Okay, so a video of a politician swearing or dancing won't set off national security alarms. President Trump is a total and complete dip. But as AI technology gets better and more believable, Farid worries about populations primed for manipulation. What concerns me a great deal in this country in particular is how partisan we are. And when you have that kind of deep, deep partisanship, that outright hatred of the other side, not just disagreement, the disinformation campaigns are much more effective because they will take hold because everybody's already there. Here's something you might have seen before on your social media feed. On artificial intelligence. A deep fake of the Nationals' Ian Hannah Mansing that seems to be selling cryptocurrency. More than $765 it's a scam. He never recorded that. It's made with AI. Okay, but what if during the next election you see multiple videos that look and sound like a journalist you trust telling you the date of the election has changed? Would you believe it? I think that's really scary when you think hey, about it. At least that, uh, what, 12 hours before election day, go supernova viral. It doesn't matter if you correct the record 12 hours later. The, the damage has been done. It's that threat to democracy that rattles this conservative MP. Politicians have large digital footprints. You know, I have over a decade worth of speeches that are on the internet, writing videos. It'd be very easy for somebody to put together uh, a deep fake video of me. Worried that Parliament isn't moving fast enough, Michelle Rempel Garner helped set up a nonpartisan working group to tackle AI. We haven't even dealt with telephone scams as a country, right? Like, we really haven't dealt with, like, beta version 
phone scams. And now here we are with very sophisticated technology that anybody can access and come up with very realistic videos, like indecipher or indistinguishable between the real thing and what's been produced. The question really is, is Canada ready to deal with this? Like these are not conversations that are happening front and center in Parliament right now, and that is concerning. Not far from Parliament, the worst case scenario is top of mind. Canada's cyber spies are already sounding the alarm about our first AI election. Carolyn Xavier is the chief of the Communication Security Establishment, or CSE, the sister agency to CSIS. This is what we fear, is potentially that there could be a foreign interference so grave that then the electoral results are, are brought into question. Simply put, is Canada ready for its deep fake election? There's lots of work we continue to need to do with regards to education and, you know, citizenship literacy. But do I think we CSC is ready, the Cyber Center? Absolutely, I think we're ready because this is what we train for. This is what we get ready for. This is why we develop our people. We anticipate the worst. Um, I'm hoping it won't happen, but we're ready. Ready to help allies like the U.S. with their election this year. When it comes to our election, CSE has the power to knock dangerous content offline. But even then, it doesn't have a magic bullet to kill deepfakes. The reality of it is, yes, it would be great to say that there's this one tool that's going to help us decipher the deepfake. We're not there yet, and, and, and I don't know that that's the focus we should have. Our focus should truly be in creating professional skepticism of the stories that are out there so that we can have critical thinking happening every time we're looking at the, the news or we're looking at the, the information that is at our disposal. So how do you do that? Remember the game I played with you earlier? Okay, so let's play this game. Well, Scott DeYoung created a board game to fight disinformation. I'm the good person, and you're trying to spread conspiracy theories? I am right? the conspiracy theorist. Okay. His research at Montreal's Concordia University is teaching people how online echo chambers and conspiracy theories work. He says deepfakes are designed to get us when we're most vulnerable. When we're scrolling on social media, we don't want to have our brains on. We're tired. We're not actually engaging with content. We're just kind of mindlessly scrolling, maybe laughing and sharing something with our friends. And that's not a time when we're going to do those steps of like, okay, we're going to stop, we're going to pause, we're going to reflect. Can we actually teach people not to fall for fake content? I would love to say yes. Like, we can teach people the skills to recognize when content is misleading. My actual advice for people during these kind of election times is to try to watch things live because it's a lot harder to see the deep fakes or the false content when, it's, when you're watching the live version. With the year of elections upon us, including maybe Canada's, experts say the best strategy is to act now. Or come election day, we might all lose. Okay, so Catherine, you can't leave us hanging here. Uh, what are some of the folks you spoke to saying about what they think might help with this? Yeah, one idea would force AI companies to stamp manipulated content with watermarks or make it so our phones authenticate our videos with the date, time, and place. Everyone we spoke to also said social media has a role to play here. Now, some of the giants say they will remove content if it crosses the line. That being said, just today, I ran across a deepfake showing the struggle is real. All right, Catherine Tunney, thanks for this. Thank you. Canadians renewing their mortgage are facing a hefty bill. If you look at what's coming, what options do homeowners have? Financial experts will give us some answers next. A mountain of Canadian mortgages are coming up for renewal, many at a significantly higher rate. We're talking about 30 to 40 to 50 percent more. A huge new pressure on already tight budgets. There are a lot of hard decisions to be made. How can homeowners get ready for the coming shock? Lindsay Duncombe breaks down what's behind those looming mortgage hikes and what experts advise to try to ease the pain. 
Brace yourselves, homeowners. Many of us are about to start paying a lot more for our homes. In the next two years, close to half of Canadian mortgages, that's 2.2 million loans, will be up for renewal. This is all happening because mortgages that were locked in, say three or five years ago, with low interest rates, are about to be up for renewal with much higher rates. Check out what happened to interest rates in the past two years. The fastest series of rate hikes in the country's history. The Bank of Canada's key lending rate went from pretty much zero to 5%. I wanted to find out how much that's going to hurt and what homeowners can do to prevent that pain. So how much will it cost? We broke it down to two examples. Say you owe $315,000 on your mortgage. That's the average in Canada. Five years ago, you could have locked into a fixed rate mortgage at 1.9%, paid off over 25 years. Now, time to renew, and you're looking at a new interest rate of 5.8%. Expect the monthly payment to jump from just over 1,300 bucks a month to close to two grand. That's an extra $665 each month. Now the situation is even tougher in cities like Toronto and Vancouver, where houses are more expensive and people owe more money. It's common to have a $600,000 mortgage. A fixed rate five years ago would have meant payments of $2,523 a month. Renewing at today's rate, that household should be prepared to pay close to $3,800 a month for a five-year fixed term, close to $1,300 higher. Ouch. Is the financial picture for people facing mortgage renewals as gloomy as this weather? Well, yeah, <laughs> I think nobody <laughs> wants to see their, uh, their mortgage rates move up. Brian Yu is the chief economist with Vancouver's Central One Credit Union. He says homeowners facing renewal should plan ahead. So I think they're bracing for this already, right? They're recognizing that, yes, things are going to be tighter this year. You're looking at more than a grand a month in payments. Can Canadians afford that? For many, they will be able to at least adapt to it. It does, make, it mean, it does mean that there are a lot of hard decisions to be made around the mortgage, about spending. Like, where are you going to be cutting? Some of you's suggestions. Reducing how much money you put into savings. Fewer or cheaper vacations. Going down to one vehicle putting off big purchases. Even at the grocery aisles, what type of products do people buy? Do you buy the more expensive brands or the lower? Everything lower is more pricing? expensive. That's true. <laughs> the sunny news, he says, is that many Canadians saved cash during the pandemic and still have a buffer. Plus, when you renew your mortgage, there are ways to reduce that payment. If you look at what's coming, what options do homeowners have? To understand that, I reached out to Tanya Barasa Ochoa, an economist with the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation. We've been seeing that mortgage borrowers are uh, trying a bunch of different things to really try to make ends meet. Borrowers are choosing longer amortization periods. The amortization is the length of time you intend to pay off the full amount of your mortgage. By adding more time, your payments go down, but you pay more in the long run. What happens is that you're gonna be paying your principal on your property on a longer period of time, but you're gonna be making those smaller payments. Remember that Vancouver-sized $600,000 mortgage? We asked Barasa Ochoa what would happen if you extended the amortization period by five years. Your monthly payment will still increase, but it will increase uh, by $900 approximately, rather than close to $1,300. What it means at the end of the day, is it's gonna be costing you less today, but you're gonna be paying your mortgage over a period of 30 years, rather than paying it over a period of 25 years. That's still a significant increase, right? You're still paying $900 a month more on that. What else can people do to try and offset that big hit? Uh, we believe that Canadians will be able to uh, be creative and find the ways that they can to make their payments on time. People are still making payments, she says. Even with higher interest rates, delinquencies are at historic lows. Canadians will prioritize mortgage payments over other payments. 
but we are seeing when we're digging into some of the numbers, we are seeing that more Canadians are actually struggling to make ends meet. So it's definitely telling us that there is this financial pressure that is being felt. So what about selling your house? Economists say hold off if you can. Rents are high and so are new houses. If you can hold on, the pressure may start to ease at least a little. There are signs the Bank of Canada will keep rates where they are and may even start cutting them later in the year. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. So a lot to consider, a lot of uncertainty. Rubina Amanhak, you are a personal finance columnist. I know you get a lot of questions. It seems like the most important thing right now mm -hmm. is what now? So you have people who are about to renew their mortgages. You know, we normally think of either you're locked into a fixed mortgage, so you can't take advantage of the rates, or you can get a variable. Is there any other wiggle room than those two? There is, uh, and I think a lot of people, when they think fixed rate, they think five years. You can go for a shorter uh, term if you're not sure where interest rates are going, and that means that you will have another opportunity uh, to fix a new rate or go variable. Uh, a lot of economists are saying there could be a rate cut this year, and that, of course, is going to weigh on you when you make that decision. So when you sit down with your bank, it's not just clear-cut, variable, or fixed. You can do a lot of blended options as well, and you could definitely make that term shorter, so that it gives you options in the future. You're going to have to do your homework though right because I would imagine a bank isn't particularly interested in selling you a shorter <laughs> fixed term mortgage rate yeah mortgages are their biggest product uh, they make most money off that than they do for practically anything else they sell you um, you can uh, go to many sites rate comparison sites that tell you what every bank across the country is offering I would use that as a first place uh, to get some information you can shop around you can call all the big banks and see what they're offering just be aware that if you are uh, doing many applications they're doing a hard check and that can impact your credit score so be aware of that before you go and apply at all different banks for that mortgage. I want to ask you about stress tests too because we hear about financial stress tests certainly for first-time buyers but but what if you're not a first-time buyer and you're just going to renew? D does that apply to you in any way? It can. Uh, so if you're renewing with your same uh, financial institution, you will not be stress test again. If you're taking your mortgage to a new bank and your mortgage is still insured, then if you already went through a stress test, the government has now said you do not need to be stress test again. But if you're taking your mortgage to another bank, you have an uninsured mortgage, you could be subject to a stress test. And of course, you have to prove that you can pay that mortgage at that much higher interest rate than what you signed up for originally. Okay, there's a lot that's complicated here. One last question. You're starting to hear a lot about people who want to extend their mortgage, who feel like they have no choice but to make 15 years, 20 years, 25, 30. What, what goes through your mind when you hear people talk about that? So there's two things happening. One is, are you just trying to improve your cash flow situation? So if you're extending your mortgage, your payments will go down, you'll have more money to pay for the day-to-day -day stuff, your utilities, your kids' activities, things that happen that you have to pay for on a monthly basis. But be aware that you're paying more interest and it is going to take you longer to pay that mortgage off. And that means other financial goals, whether they be retirement or you know vacations or whatever it is in the future for you, may have to wait because your mortgage is taking longer to pay off. All right, Rubina, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Next, an Edmonton man's extreme cold experiment. I start doing a different one every day. The freezing magic trick in our moment. Oh, wow. So that egg couldn't stand a chance against the Alberta cold. Temperatures dropped to around minus 45 degrees Celsius in the province over the weekend, and it gave one Edmonton man an excellent idea. See what I did there? So while most people would prefer to stay bundled up at home, Joe Chowanak went outdoors to see how many items he could freeze midair. Turns out quite a few. His winter experiment makes our moment. It was right to the bone cold. I just needed something to do in this extremely cold weather, so I started doing a different one every day. Uh, I started with the, the hot boiling water, moved to the noodles, the egg, and then the toilet paper. So well, the egg, I taped down two uh, uh, chopsticks across a, fr a frying pan and then kind of balanced the egg and cracked it on that. It was so cold, it literally took an egg out of the fridge two to three minutes to freeze. I just had to hold the chopsticks and the noodles above the bowl um, for a minute. Toilet paper roll. That was the hard one. 
I hung it from a wind chime anchor that we had on our house, and then I uh, put it at the bottom on a cookie tray, and then just sprayed down the whole thing, and then cut the string that I had so that it would just hang there. I just wanted to let people know that even though it's brutally cold, you, can, you might as well have fun with it and uh, enjoy it. It's, uh, it's part of being Canadian. Okay, so we're all little kids at heart. Um, I don't want to be a nag, but it, throwing hot water around doesn't always end particularly well. The temperatures have warmed up a little, little bit in Edmonton, like around a balmy minus 20 now to that minus 45. So be careful. From all of us at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.